Hi everyone, welcome back. Today in this mini lecture we're going to talk about Sommerfeld theory. So this is an extension of the Druda model in which we start thinking about electrons as quantum mechanical objects. So before we start, let's review the basic assumptions of the Druda model. Remember, in the Druda model, we assume that the electrons are classical. We assume that uh, the electrons collide with immobile ions. We assume that the electrons are free, which is to say they don't interact with the ions except during these collisions. We assume that the electrons are independent. They do not interact with each other. And we assume that the electrons reach thermal equilibrium via this process of collisions. Remember, this list of assumptions in some sense serves as an outline for the course. So having talked about the Druda model, uh, we're now going to gradually dismantle and relax these assumptions one by one. Um, today we're going to focus on assumption zero. We're going to think about how should we take the first steps toward treating electrons quantum mechanically. So one way to think about assumption zero is that the Druda model assumes that the electrons obey Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics. which is to say we assume in the Druda model that uh, the distribution of the electronic velocities V has the following form. It looks like some prefractors times e to the minus mv squared over two kbt. Now the notation I'm using for this distribution function f here is such that f of v dv is equal to the number of electrons per unit volume within dv of v. Now, as we've seen, this Druda model, which assumes classical Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics from the electrons, gives surprisingly accurate predictions for things like uh, the Hall coefficient, magnetic resistance, and Wiedemann-Bond's law. Though we talked a little bit last time in previous mini lectures about how the accuracy of the Wiedemann-Franz law relies on two errors that cancel each other out. In the Druda model, we compute the value of the mean square velocity that is empirically too small, uh, and we compute a specific heat that is too large, and these errors cancel out in the wiedemann franz law. So today we're going to start fixing these problems, and we're going to do this by removing assumption zero. We're going to start thinking about electrons as quantum, mechan quantum mechanical objects. We'll solve the Schrodinger equation for free electrons, and we'll build up many particle energies by assuming that the electrons obey the Fermi Dirac distribution, which of course they should. So here's the Fermi Dirac distribution. You may have seen this before. Uh, the factors out in front are to ensure the proper normalization. Something else that we need to fix uh, to ensure the proper normalization is this characteristic temperature T naught. 
as we will see, this characteristic temperature T naught is of order 10 to the 4 Kelvin. For most metals. So already you can see why it is that the Fermi Dirac distribution will fix the problem with the mean square velocity that we had with the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Uh, there really isn't a characteristic temperature associated with the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, but there is with the Fermi Dirac distribution and it's rather high. So you might off the bat expect that this distribution will predict much larger velocities than the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Um, so just to remind you of what these distribution functions look like, let me plot them here for you. So on the y-axis will be the value of these functions. Let me plot on the x-axis the quantity mv squared over kvt. Now the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution will look something like this, where it doesn't have any appreciable value beyond x equals one. But of course the Fermi-Dirac distribution looks something like this. It's equal to one um, until for typical values of T naught around 10 to the four Kelvin at x equals 100 or with the uh, energy is roughly 100 times higher than the temperature, this distribution will reduce to zero. So again, this shouldn't be surprising to you. You should have seen this distribution before. You should remember that the Fermi Dirac distribution has this characteristic shape. Uh, you can see that if the electrons obey the Fermi Dirac distribution, there will be many more of them that have substantially higher velocities than what the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution would predict. Uh, and this excess weight was up here in the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, and it is retransferred over here in the case of the Fermi Dirac distribution. So, Sommerfeld theory really consists of the Duda model plus Fermi Dirac statistics. So we're still going to imagine uh, that we have a free electron gas as we did in the Judo model, but we're going to insist that the electrons obey Fermi Dirac uh, statistics. Um, so we're gonna start by computing the ground state properties of the free electron gas. Now, you might ask, why should we care about the ground state properties of the free electron gas? After all, human compatible temperatures are of order 300 Kelvin, which is obviously not T equals zero. Um, but remember that this characteristic temperature, T naught, which is of order 10 to the four Kelvin, as we'll see, is substantially higher than uh, room temperature, 295 Kelvin. So um, it's not so hard to see now that actually the ground state properties of the free electron gas are actually relevant um, in many cases. So let's go about computing this. So the first thing we're going to do is solve the Schrodinger equation. So the electrons, we've assumed are independent. So we're free then to build many body wave functions out of single particle levels. Uh, so let's go about solving for these single particle levels for uh, free electrons. These, sim these single particle levels satisfy the Schrodinger equation. So here, uh, E, curly E, is a single particle energy. And psi of R 
is a single particle wave function. Now, we haven't included any potential energy in the Schrodinger equation. That's because the electrons are free. So if you like, uh, our assumption that we can build many body wave functions out of single particle levels comes about because we're assuming the electrons are independent. The fact that no potential here occurs is because we have assumed that the electrons are free. Um, so uh, this is the Schrodinger equation we, we have to solve. Um, of course, when we solve uh, any, uh, any quantum mechanical wave function problem like this, we have to think about uh, boundary conditions. So let's do that. So most often we'll be concerned about properties of metals in the bulk. We won't worry so much about surface properties. So in some sense, we're free to pick whichever boundary conditions we think are most convenient for us. So we're going to choose periodic boundary conditions. These are sometimes called born von Karman boundary conditions. So let's suppose we have a chunk of metal of size capital V, that's the volume of the chunk, e equals L cubed. So the characteristic size of a piece of metal is L. Uh, we'll require that psi of x, y, and z plus L is equal to psi of x, y, and z. And likewise for the other spatial dimensions. Again, in some sense, these boundary conditions emphasize that uh, the boundaries or the surfaces uh, really don't matter. And because we're concerned with the behavior of the bulk, uh, this choice makes sense. So let's go on to solve the Schrodinger equation. You know what the solution to the Schrodinger equation uh, for free particles is? It's a plane wave. With quantum number K. The eigenvalue associated with the quantum number K is H bar squared K squared over 2M. Let me write it in the following way. Now, notice that the wave functions are properly normalized. As they should be. Let's ask, what is the meaning of this quantum number K? So to answer that question, remember that the momentum operator, P, for any wave function is h bar over i times gradient operator. So you can easily see that the momentum operator acting on psi, so I'm going to suppress the quantum number k and the position argument r, is h bar over i times now the gradient of psi, which is i k times psi itself. So you see that psi 
these single particle wave functions we wrote down before, which are plane waves, are eigenfunctions of the momentum operator. And the momentum eigenvalue is h bar k. So we'll say that p is equal to h bar k. We'll say that the momentum of this wave function is h bar k. And we'll imagine that we can extract a velocity, which is h bar k over m. Now, remember that E, the energy eigenvalue is h bar squared k squared over 2m. This is equal to p squared over 2m, as we expect. So this quantum number k is related to the momentum of the electron. It's also a wavelength, and uh, it makes sense to define a characteristic wavelength associated with this plane wave as 2 pi over the magnitude of this uh, variable k. So these are the wave functions. Let us now apply the boundary conditions to these wave functions. As always, when we apply boundary conditions to a quantum mechanical wave function that will restrict the possible allowed values of the quantum number. So let's see what happens there. Remember, we're applying periodic boundary conditions. Uh, it's not so hard to see that the boundary conditions that we wrote down before require that e to the i kxl is equal to e to the i kyl equals e to the i kzl equals 1, where I specified the wave vector k as a vector with three components, kx, ky, and kz. So if this is true, it shouldn't be too hard to see that um, kx should be equal to 2 pi times some integer nx over l. ky should be equal to 2 pi times some other integer 2 pi and y over l. And kz should be equal to 2 pi and z over l, where nx, ny, and nz are integers. So again, not surprisingly, uh, when we have enforced the boundary conditions on these wave functions, uh, they have restricted the possible values of the quantum numbers. So this is something that's important. We've now defined the allowed quantum numbers for uh, free electrons. Let's talk about how we compute quantities uh, of the free electron gas. Often we'll be interested in average quantities associated with the electron gas. We'll be interested in things like the integral over all possible values of k uh, of some function hashtag of k. So let's talk about how we would compute that. Um, the thing that we need to know is what is this characteristic increment of k space dk? Uh, this is really the volume in k space of each allowed uh, single electron level. So to answer that question, let me make a two-dimensional plot of all possible allowed values of uh, k for this free electron picture. So kx and ky can take on uh, values of 2 pi over L times an integer. So I'm going to symbolize the allowed values of, of k in this two-dimensional cut through k space with dots. So the allowed values of k form a rectangular or a square array of allowed values. So this square pattern repeats in all directions. And really, it's a three-dimensional pattern, but I'm drawing you a two-dimensional cut. And the space between each of these points is 2 pi over L in the x and y directions, and also in the z direction. 
So we would say that the volume in K space of each allowed point is just 2 pi over L cubed, which is 8 pi cubed over capital V, where capital V is the volume of the sample. So we'll say that this is the volume of each allowed point in K space. Moreover, we'll say that any volume capital omega in K space contains capital omega divided by eight pi cubed over V or capital omega times V over eight pi cubed states. All right. So these are properties of generic free electrons um, in K space. Now let's bring in the Pauli exclusion principle. Pauli exclusion principle says that no two electrons can have the same quantum numbers. So for an n electron state, We can put at most two electrons in each single particle level. Factor two comes about because we can put a spin up and a spin down electron in, I, in either level, in any level, without violating uh, the, the uh, the Pauli exclusion principle. So when we are computing the ground state properties of the free electron gas, uh, we'll just fill up um, uh, the level starting from the lowest energy and we'll add two electrons into each level, again starting with the lowest levels first. And uh, remember that the uh, energy of the single particle levels goes like k squared. So as we're filling up these levels from lower energy to higher energy, uh, we're going to fill in levels um, with, with constant values of, uh, of, of k squared. Um, so what this means is that we're going to be filling up uh, a sphere, right, this is, uh, if you like, isotropic. There's no preferred dependence uh, of the energy on K. So as we're filling up levels starting from the lowest energy first, we're going to fill up uh, a sphere in K space. And this is called the Fermi sphere. So, Again, if I take a two-dimensional cut in K space, uh, the, the lines of constant energy look like circles. In this two-dimensional cut, they look like spheres in uh, three dimensions. Um, the lowest energy configuration for a certain number of electrons consists of all levels inside this circle or sphere full, and any levels outside this sphere empty. So this is called the Fermi sphere. The radius of the sphere is the Fermi wave vector. Kf. Now the number of levels inside the Fermi sphere is The volume of the Fermi sphere, four pi, four thirds pi kf cubed, divided by the volume per 
level, or if you like, times v over 8 pi cubed. This is kf cubed over 6 pi squared times the volume v. Now, the actual number of levels is twice this number because of the spin degeneracy. So capital N, the total number of levels uh, inside the Fermi sphere is twice kf cubed over 6 pi squared v. This tells us that the density, little n, which is big N over v, is kf cubed over 3 pi squared. So you see the density of electrons in a metal is uh, proportional to the cube of the Fermi wave vector kf. Now there are some other things we can define. Ef, which is h bar squared kf squared over 2m. This is the Fermi energy. Pf, which is h bar kf. This is the Fermi momentum. And Vf, which is Pf over m, is the Fermi velocity. These are commonly encountered terms. Um, we can also rewrite what's going on here. We can also rewrite the Fermi energy as E squared over twice A naught times Kf A naught squared. Remember that A naught is the Bohr radius. It is h bar squared over m e squared. It's about 0.5 angstroms. Remember that E squared over 2 A naught is the Rydberg, the binding energy of hydrogen. This is 13.6. EV. Uh, you can convince yourself that for typical densities, Kf is uh, of order um, angstroms or less, uh, is, is of order one inverse angstroms uh, or so. So this factor here is roughly of order unity. So you see that typical uh, Fermi energies in metals are of order uh, EV or Tens of uh, tens of electron volts. So, and if you ask yourself what is the equivalent temperature, let's call it a TF, which is equal to EF over KB, you find something like ten to the four Kelvin. Remember, room temperature is a fortieth of an electron volt. Um, so this again confirms our suspicion that uh, it is perfectly worthwhile and valid to think about the ground state properties of free electron gases because uh, indeed we suspect a very high degree of precision metals at room temperature at room temperature are in fact in the ground state configuration. So the next mini lecture we'll talk about explicit calculations of the t equals zero ground state properties of metals.